Hi, thanks for joining our session where you will learn how to measure, report, and reduce the carbon emissions of your Google Cloud applications. My name is Savannah Goodman, and I'm a technical program manager on Google's data center energy team, where I work on our 24 seven carbon free energy program. I'm joined today by my colleague, Darren. Hi, I'm Starren Giannini. I'm a senior product manager at Google Cloud. Thanks for joining us. To start, I want to talk about three key categories of carbon emissions associated with running workloads on cloud. The primary source of carbon emissions for computing is from the electricity that's consumed by the data centers powering those workloads. Electricity is produced by the power plants that are operating on a particular regional grid. Those power plants could be a combination of carbon emitting fossil fuel generators, such as coal or gas, and carbon free generators, such as wind or solar. Different regional electric grids have different makeups of power plants depending on the resources available within that region. This means that carbon emissions from the grid will vary depending on the location the electricity is being consumed. Also, in order to meet the demand for electricity, different power plants need to operate at different times of the day. This means that the grid emissions can vary on an hourly basis. For example, on a grid with abundant solar energy during the day, the emissions of the grid will be lower than at night when the grid may rely on natural gas generators. Next, in the rare event of a power outage, data centers will run on backup generators, which typically rely on diesel fuels and therefore emit carbon. Finally, there are emissions from activities that are not directly related to powering the data centers. For example, there are emissions from the manufacturing and disposal of the hardware that's put into the data centers. There's also emissions from Google employees traveling to and from the data centers in order to support the construction or operations. The scope of these upstream and downstream activities is quite large, but it's important to account for these indirect emissions when thinking about the total carbon input impact of a workload. In order to eliminate our primary source of direct emissions, Google has set a goal to achieve 24-7 carbon-free electricity by 2030. To specify what we mean by carbon-free, we include energy produced by wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, nuclear, hydropower, pump storage, and battery discharge. So, for each region we operate in, we measure the percentage of carbon-free energy consumed in a particular location on an hourly basis. In addition to the carbon-free energy that's already supplied by the grid, Google invests in renewable energy generation in each location we operate in. Let's take a look at our data center in Iowa as an example. The regional grid in Iowa has a carbon-free energy score of 32%, but Google has invested enough wind energy to increase the average hourly score to over 90%. As a customer, the regional CFE score represents the average percentage of time your applications deployed in that cloud region will be running on carbon-free energy. Remember that Google Cloud is carbon neutral, meaning that Google purchases enough renewable energy and carbon offsets on an annual basis to neutralize the operational emissions associated with your workloads. Given that the difference in carbon emissions heavily depends on the region, we will be diving into how to consider carbon when selecting your cloud regions. But first, I'll go over the different considerations in addition to carbon when picking a region. As a developer, you should consider is there a data locality constraint? Meaning, does this data or workload need to be located in a certain region due to a regulatory or legal constraint? Next, what's the latency requirement? Depending on the workload type, latency may be higher or lower priority. For example, production workloads serving user traffic may require a much lower latency than a batch job. What's the cost? Different regions may have different prices, thus impacting the operational cost. Finally, as we know, each region can have a significantly different carbon emissions profile, so we need to consider this impact when selecting a region. That is why we've published the carbon-free energy scores for every region we operate in. As you can see, the CFE score can vary greatly between regions, even between some that may be relatively close in proximity. For example, you can see that if you move a workload from Salt Lake City, which has a CFE score of 28%, to Oregon, which has a CFE score of 90%, you can, you can significantly reduce its carbon emissions. In fact, selecting a low region is one of the most impactful choices you can make to reduce your overall cloud carbon emissions footprint. This data is available on our cloud website, GitHub, and as a BigQuery public data set. 
Now, I'll hand it off to Starin, who will tell you more specifically about the data we've published and the other ways we've incorporated it into our products. Our first step to help customers pick a Google Cloud region based on carbon was to publish carbon information on every Google Cloud region on the Cloud website. So on this page, you can find a table with, for every Google Cloud region, its average Google carbon-free energy percentage, as well as its average annual grid carbon intensity. As you can see, some regions get a small low CO2 label. This is given when the region meets a certain criteria of a high carbon-free intensity, uh, carbon-free energy percentage, or a low um, grid carbon intensity. Our next step was to add all over the Google Cloud documentation in the locations pages, those same labels. So here we are on the Cloud Storage documentation. And you can see for every region where cloud storage is available, we call out if this region is low carbon. We went even further by adding in context of the cloud console, the same information. So here we are in Cloud Run and users have to pick a region when they create a service. Well, as you can see, right in context of the region selector, we added the same low CO2 information, helping you at a glance know which regions have the lowest carbon impact. And lastly, as Savannah said, because picking a region is more than just considering carbon, you have to consider carbon, price, latency. We've built this very simple tool that allows you to enter what you care about and returns you the best region based on your inputs. So let's say, for example, that you are running a daily background job. In that case, you probably don't care about latency. And let's assume that um, you, know, you, you care as much about price as you care about carbon. In that case, we recommend you to use uh, our Iowa data center. But now let's assume that you are in France and um, you know you 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 really care about latency, um, but um, you you also care very much about carbon. In that case, we would recommend Europe North One. And in case you really want to optimize for price too, then um, you, know, you see how the selection and the recommendation actually changes. So we hope that providing this simple tool that is based on open data we published the carbon data I presented earlier, the public uh, prices of Google Cloud, um, and the approximation of the distances, uh, we can help you pick a region based on what you care about, and notably carbon information. Before rolling out these changes, we wanted to measure their impact. So we rolled out an A-B testing experiment to measure if displaying carbon information in the Cloud Console region pickers would influence customers' behavior. After running it for enough time, we got those significant results. Among all users, 19% of them were more likely to select a low carbon region when they were exposed to the low CO2 indicator in the region picker. And among new Google Cloud users, more than 50% of them were more likely to select the low carbon regions those users are users who did not yet have picked um, a region for their architecture. So we've explored how we are sharing regional carbon information. Now, let me introduce you to Google Cloud Carbon Footprint. So customers reach us to help them meet their sustainability goals. Many of them are needing insights into the carbon footprint of their cloud usage. And if we think about it, the cloud is like a black box. Many of our customers have done estimates that were lacking some critical data to come up with carbon footprint numbers. With Google Cloud Carbon Footprint, we help you report on your gross carbon emission of your Google Cloud usage, and we help you reduce 
your company's carbon footprint. Let's see it in action. Let me introduce you to Google Cloud Carbon Footprint. Here I am in the Google Cloud Console. From the left navigation, I scroll down under Tools and I select Carbon Footprint. Here I can see the carbon footprint coming from the electricity used by GCP resources for the selected billing account. This dashboard is accessible to anyone from the Cloud Console who has access to the billing account. Let's take a closer look. At the top, we have a recap of the footprint. On the left, the carbon footprint for the last year. In the middle, the carbon footprint for the current month compared to the previous month. And on the right, a reminder that Google is investing in enough renewable and carbon offsets to neutralize all of its global operations. Below, we have four charts, breaking down the same information over different dimensions. The first one is showing the carbon footprint over time, broken down by month. So this is chart will be quite useful to see uh, how you are trending and if you are successful at reducing your carbon footprint. To the right, we have uh, the carbon footprint for the last month broken down by Google Cloud projects. Below, we have the same data, but this time broken down by Google Cloud product. And finally, we have the carbon footprint for the last month broken down by Google Cloud regions. So this is a curated dashboard of the carbon footprint data that we computed for the given billing account. But you might need uh, some customization of this dashboard, or you might want to drill down into the data. This is why we provide this export mechanism. By simply clicking export at the top right, you will uh, be able to schedule a BigQuery export of the carbon footprint data. So I scheduled it before. Here I am in BigQuery. And as you can see, um, this is the table that we export in the selected project. So the table has the same dimensions, uh, the month, the billing account, the project, the services, the locations, the carbon footprint. And you can see, uh, you can explore it using uh, SQL queries. Um, and you can see how you could build any query you want, grouping by any dimension you want uh, to create your own um, reporting. It is pretty, very easy to uh, save this data into a spreadsheet. So I did so just before. And here you see the exact same data, this time in Google Sheets, where again, you can very easily create charts um, or uh, custom uh, computations based on the carbon footprint data that we computed for your billing account. So we are very uh, excited to introduce this to you today, a self-service carbon footprint of your Google Cloud usage right inside the Cloud Console, available to anyone. Let me deep dive into the methodology that we use to compute this per customer carbon footprint. It can be broken down in three steps. The first one is a Google-wide internal carbon apportionment. We take three inputs for that one. First, the measured energy consumption of Google Cloud data centers, taking into account the power usage effectiveness. Then, the actual resource usage of dedicated or shared resources for every internal accounting group. And lastly, the carbon intensity of the region where the data center is located. This gives us, for all of Google, the carbon footprint per hour, region, and internal accounting group. The next step is to look at this data from the lens of Google Cloud. So we filter the previous data on Google Cloud accounting groups, and we bring in Google Cloud billing data in order to calculate the carbon footprint per day, 
Google Cloud Region, and Google Cloud SKU. The third step is to compute a per customer carbon footprint. So we blend the previous data with actual customer usage to compute the carbon footprint per day, region, Google Cloud service, Google Cloud project, and of course, customer. Finally, we aggregate this data on a monthly basis and we display it on the Google Cloud Console dashboard or we export it into BigQuery. We have been sharing the private preview of Google Cloud Carbon Footprint to a few early testers. They shared with us feedback, like Hervé Dumas, who is Sustainability IT Director at L'Oréal. He tells us, the capability to measure and understand the environmental footprint of our public cloud usage is among the key axes of our sustainable tech roadmap. With Google Cloud Carbon Footprint, we are now able to directly follow the impact of our sustainable infrastructure approach and architecture principles. Now back to you, Savannah, for a recap. To conclude, we're going to summarize what you can do to reduce your carbon footprint. Consider carbon in your decisions. For first, make sure to pick a cleaner region for your new applications. If you are going to run an application over time, running in the region with the highest CFE score will emit the lowest carbon emissions. Second, run batch jobs on the cleanest option. Batch workloads often have the benefit of planning, so you should be able to pick the region with the highest CFE available to you. Finally, set an organizational policy for clean regions. You can restrict the location of your resources to a particular Google Cloud region or subset of region using organizational policy constraints. And lastly, we want you to remember that Google Cloud gives you all the tools to optimize your region selection, for example, by publishing region carbon data on the Google Cloud website, by providing a region picking tool, and by displaying in context of the Cloud Console and Cloud documentation, those small low CO2 indicators. But we also want you to remember that Google Cloud gives you the tools to report on your gross carbon emissions. Today, we have announced Google Cloud Carbon Footprint to help you understand and reduce your cloud carbon footprint linked to your cloud usage. We are hoping it will be very helpful to you. Thanks for joining us, Savannah. Thanks, Darren. And thank you for joining our session on cloud carbon emissions. We hope you enjoy the rest of Cloud Next.